It is uh, certainly a pleasure to see each of you here this morning. Uh, we know typically how we try to spend Saturday mornings uh, after a very uh, interesting work week sometimes, but there are some Saturday mornings that are worth giving up, and this is one of those Saturday mornings that I assure you it will be worth giving up. The discussions and the topics that will be covered this morning are very essential to our improvement and our progress. And so it is my pleasure as president of this great university, founded in 1875, to welcome you here this morning, to welcome you to what we affectionately call the Hill, the beautiful campus nestled in the hills here in North Alabama. We are a 1890 land-grant university that makes us the people's university, and we are concerned about people. On behalf of our Board of Trustees, our faculty, our wonderful students, the alumni, and all of the individuals that make up the Alabama Agricultural and Mechanical University family, welcome, and we are certain that you are in for a very informative session that you, at the end of the day, will say, I'm really, really happy that I gave up my Saturday morning to be here. We want to extend a special welcome to uh, Dr. Rivers and to Ms. Dowling and to Dr. Slaughter and all of those persons who have come to be a part of this and to share this experience. And let me make a commitment to them. Uh, we certainly want to invite you to come back next year and we will endeavor that we will have even more persons present next year than we have this year. Uh, I think for a first, uh, it's not what we would want it to be, but it is, of course, much better. Uh, and so we thank you. And on one last note, and I'll sit, uh, you know there's a part in the scripture which says where one or two are gathered. And so even though there may be few of us here this morning, we can still have a very informative session. So again, welcome, and let's enjoy the day. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm David Rivers, and again, as Dr. Guinea said earlier, we're glad that you were able to come this morning. We know how hard it is uh, to do anything on a Saturday morning, especially for old people like me. Um, after Friday night, uh, it's sort of hard, but uh, this Community Leadership Institute is very important, we think, and I know you, you'll feel the same way when you hear some of the presentation. This is our 32nd uh, Community Leaders Institute that we've done around the country, primarily in Georgia and South, in South Carolina and Georgia, but we've done them, um, we're doing one in Alaska, we've done them in, uh, we've done them in, we're going to do one in Seattle, uh, we've done some in New, New Mexico and Albuquerque, we've done them in, um, Phoenix, Arizona, the Virgin Islands, and all over the place. So this is our 32nd Community Leaders Institute. We come, we bring people that can provide information about key topics such as health care, economic development, uh, youth issues, and all of the key things that makes a, a community healthy. So you'll find this very informative. So we again want to welcome you to this Community Leadership Institute. Another thing we do we give you a lot of information during the Community Leaders Institute, but we also come back and do a technical assistance workshop where we talk about opportunities for grant, where to find grants, how to put together a good grant application, uh, and take you online and help you prepare a grant application. Because everything we talk about in these uh, Leadership Institute costs money. So I know you want to know where is the money, and we, we try to help you find the money also. I'd like to thank all of the sponsors who've uh, made this possible, especially Ms. Melinda Downing, from the Department of Energy. It's very important because she financed these, um, these institutes. In other words, we have a contract with DOE to do these institutes around the country. And I'm sure um, we'll be back uh, next year to continue this effort. So again, thank you very much, and I welcome Ms. Melinda Downing from DOE. 
I want to welcome those who were here last evening back. And for those for the first time this morning, thank you for coming out. On the behalf of the Department of Energy, I am truly honored to be here today as part of this Community Leaders Institute at the university. I want to thank the president for hosting it, Ms. Ter Tony Smalls for all of her efforts to help coordinate it. And again, uh, just because we don't have a full crowd, what I would recommend, the things that you hear today, you're going to hear a lot of information, which is going to be good resources and assets that can help you better um, be informed and deal with the different issues that you have. So your friends, your neighbors who aren't here to experience it, I would ask that you go back and share the information with them. Because the Community Leaders Institute has been um, recognized as a national program, and there is not one community that I know of that has not found information that was not beneficial to them. So again, this is a very important event. I'm happy to see you here, and I know that you're going to go away with something useful. So thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Sabra Slaughter from the Medical University of South Carolina, and I am so pleased to be here with you uh, to be a part of this panel to uh, moderate uh, what you will find to be a most expert group of presenters. We think that this is a, an excellent way to proceed this morning because of the discussion we had last night was so rich with ideas around health and health disparities and we heard about the Affordable Health Care Act and uh, the many ways in which it is helping our nation as well as more specifically addressing issues in, in uh, Alabama. Uh, last night as I was trying to make remarks to uh, thank uh, Dr. Hugeni and the, as the host, I said, Alabama State University. <laughs> and Dr. Hugeni grabbed my hand as, as he was leaving. He said, now, I, I'm going to let that slide, but you bring me $2 million and <laughs> we'll be sorry. So I am thanking Alabama A&M University for uh, hosting us, and, and uh, we very, very much uh, appreciate you, Dr. Hugeni, and all your staff and assistants here. Uh, in addition to my role as in administration, I am also very much interested in health disparities and improving the quality and accessibility of care, as well as eliminating health disparities. And for a long time, I've been interested in uh, equity in the workforce. How do we groom new uh, health professionals to come through the pipeline and assume the roles that we are creating and identifying as, as tremendously needing attention, of especially folk from the communities in which are most impacted by health disparities. So this uh, opportunity to moderate this panel, as in other community institutes, will allow me to at least raise that flag and to those of you who might be in the pathway, and I've, I've chatted with a couple of folk here who are thinking about careers in the healthcare industry, I would very much appreciate learning more about you and if there are ways in which I can be of assistance to your movement through that pathway. Um, health is the, I think, the point at which all of the social forces intersect. And we talked about that last night. We talked about the social determinants of health. We talked about income, employment, educational attainment, food security, availability of housing and transportation. We talked about uh, a number of things like um, the isms that uh, affect us, uh, racism, sexism, and the other forms of discrimination. Uh, we know that health is not something that happens in isolation, but is something that is very much paired to all of the social forces that impact us. We know that the healthcare system itself is really key in, in terms of us overcoming the disparities that exist in our, in our country and, and in, in our communities. Um, the panel this morning will address many of these topics, and um, I will not uh, belabor by you, the repetition of everything that's printed in the program, and I and invite you to read those uh, bios, but just briefly let me share with you who uh, will be presenting. Uh, Dr. Sherry Squares is the uh, medical director at the Huntsville Emergency Department, and she's also the medical director of HIMSA, which is the ambulance service that uh, serves at the Huntsville Hospital as well, uh, in the entire area. She is actually replacing uh, Mr. Tracy Dowdy, who was unable to be here this morning, but I got acquainted with Ms. Squares, and she has some, some very, very interesting information to, to share with us about 
um, both their partnerships with community, but one of the key issues that we are concerned about as it relates to health care is how do we avoid folk becoming so ill that they end up in the emergency room? And she'll talk about it from that perspective. If they aren't touched before, through prevention, what happens and how they address uh, those ends of need. Uh, then we have uh, Mr. Ray Clark, who is senior partner in the Clark Group. Uh, he has held leadership positions in the U.S. Army uh, as Assistant Secretary of the Army, also been a consultant to the White House. He is one of the foremost authorities of national environmental policy. Uh, so we welcome uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, also, Dr. Thomas Ellison. I read Dr. Ellison's uh, bio in the program, and I said, Dr. Ellison, what should I say? I mean, you got so much here. Please, just tell me what should I say? And he said, listen, I am proudest of the recognition I received from uh, President Obama, and I am proud of the students that I have mentored uh, through their careers, and I will ask him to, to share some of those observations with you. Another powerful expert member of our panel. And finally, we have um, Ms. Jeanette Jordan, who is a, um, a well-known person in the healthcare industry. She is a uh, diabetes, uh, certified diabetes educator. She is also a registered dietitian. She's an educator, uh, an author of several books. She's been featured in, uh, on many television and radio programs and is just really a powerful uh, person to be a part of this panel. Each member of the panel will have approximately uh, 10 minutes uh, to speak, and we will reserve the remainder of the time for questions and answers. I would ask the panelists to come in the order in which I've uh, introduced you, and uh, we'll proceed. Thank you very much. Hi. Well, as I was introduced, I'm Dr. Sherry Squires. I am the medical director, one of the medical directors at Huntsville Hospital here in Huntsville. Um, we are a regional referral center. I have been in Huntsville for 23 years, grew up in Texas, and have, when I first came here, didn't think that I would stay. My husband, you know, wanted to come back here. He's from the area and promised me that if I'd give, give it two years here, if I didn't like it, we could go somewhere else, and we're still here. And I think if he tried to drag me away, I'd be the one fussing. But part of that is that the community is good. It's a very rich, diverse community, but, but also because my career is good. Huntsville Hospital is an ideal place for me to practice because I see a lot of everything. We're a regional referral center, and Mr. Doty sends his regrets for not being here. He had wanted to come, but he said, I think they'd like to hear from a doctor. I'm not sure if that's true. He would have given you a great perspective, too. He's our administrator. Um, our hospital is a regional referral center we treat everything except um, big burns we refer out and transplants we refer out. So as an emergency physician in a center like this, we see about 120,000 people a year in that center. I mean, that's a huge impact. And if you think about you know, the impact on the community with them and their families and all, that's a whole other outreach program. Um, we function in emergency medicine. We think of ourselves as the safety net. But unfortunately, a lot of times it's kind of like you're the dead end, too, or you're kind of the end of that climb. And a lot of what we see is the results of the disparity in health care and the fact that a lot of people do not get adequate health care at the community level, at the primary care level, at the education level out there. Um, I see that there's not a month or a week that goes by where I don't see something that was totally preventable. I had a 32-year-old black man come into my ER 4th of July weekend with a heart attack. This guy had had hypertension for who knows how long, had never been diagnosed. One time somebody had told him, hey, your blood pressure's a little high, you need to get it checked. He didn't. You know, and so he ends up in my ER with a, a heart attack. And he had not only had his heart attack that night, he really probably started having, he had chest pain the night before and probably had had the start of that the night before and is, was discharged with some significant heart damage. I mean, this guy, that's a, probably a career ender. He didn't have the kind of heart attack that you just send up to the lab, get a, get a calf and get a balloon and 
go about your business. He probably had significant damage because he waited to come in. And so you look at, okay, you know, in business circles, the root cause analysis. The root cause analysis of that man's poor health for probably the rest of his life is that he didn't treat his hypertension. He smoked, he had a family history of hypertension and heart disease. But sometimes it's an education thing, sometimes it's a denial thing, but it's so preventable and so sad. And I, I hope that things like the Affordability Act and things will address this, but a lot of it comes to education, comes to peer pressure to take care of yourself and to, to go to the doctor and get things done. Some of it is... Um, some of it is insurance problems. In my department, you know, right now, luckily, we've progressed to the point that most children can have some sort of insurance. You know, there's all kids, there's Medicaid, there's all kinds of things, and it's fairly easy to get kids covered. Now, whether you've got parents educated and people follow through and they take care of their asthma and they treat their things and they don't smoke around their kids and all that, that also needs to be addressed, but at least we, we have, most of them can be insured by something so that that is not a factor. Adults, it's a different story. You know, you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. You don't have a job, you work part-time, you don't have health insurance. And they don't come. You know, and there, there are some resources. Um, our, our hospital works with, we have a healthy community initiative through our hospital foundation. And they help to fund things like heals clinics in the schools for children. Um, we've worked in the community, and this is not part of Huntsville Hospital, but Huntsville Hospital has helped to fund it in the past. There's a free clinic where people can actually come if they don't have resources and they can register there, actually get their medications there, have their diabetes tra treated there, they'll provide the test kits and strips and I mean everything. So the, the community, a lot of times there are avenues. They may not be real easy to get though. You know, you have to have transportation there. You have to have um, the ability to get all your paperwork done there. And some of these people, you know, a lot of them just don't have the resources to do all that or someone to help them do all that. So there's a huge problem. And I see the end result. You know, we, we see that at our hospital. About 30% of the people that come to Huntsville, Maine, not that the PD overall between, we have two, two sort of campuses a couple of blocks from each other. There's the pediatric, the women's and children's branch of our hospital where the pediatric ER is and then there's the main ER where you come if you're over 17. And um, we see between those two about 120,000 a year. Of the people, overall, we have about a 23% self-pay rate, which means no insurance, nothing, no Medicaid, nothing at all. That It's self-pay, it's out of their pocket. And so the hospital ends up having to, to write off a, a lot of that. And, you know, what that means, essentially, is that people that do have insurance, it, it supplements that care. But, but that's, we, we are the safety net. We don't deny care. We're mandated to do that, and we're happy to. But it's... What you see is that that segment of the population waits to come in. And then not only that, but if, if I treat them, okay, you know, you've got hypertension, you've got renal failure, you've got other problems, then there's still the issue of getting them follow-up in the community. So, you know, yeah, I can take care of, of what's acutely the problem, you know, fix the fracture, get that taken care of, admit them for their pneumonia, but then they go out and they don't get care to follow up properly or they run out of blood pressure medicine and then what, what do they do with that? So it's, it's a matter of not just providing the emergency care but providing the, the follow up care as well. So we, we do see this. I mean, I'm, I've had two that I recall in the last couple of years, men that came in that were young men that actually that, that came in, in in renal failure. I mean, I, if you are familiar with health care, you know, it's a, a, renal failure can happen for lots of reasons. The most common are diabetes and hypertension. And if you have, again, hypertension that goes untreated for years, you come in and you, your kidneys don't work anymore. And these guys are on dialysis, and that's so preventable. And then, you know, you end up, if you're lucky, getting a, a renal transplant. If you're not, you're on dialysis the rest of your life. And, and that's, that's a huge impact. I mean, three hours a week, three hours a day for three times a week you're in a dialysis chair 
that, that's not a great life to me. I mean, it's better than the alternative, but it's so preventable. And that's what, what hurts me and what I do is that we see the end results of preventable disease. And it, the quality of life could drastically be improved if, if we could somehow impact that. I truly hope that the new act, the health reform, will address that. And it wouldn't hurt my feelings at all if I saw fewer people come in with those kinds of problems. I mean, we'd, we'd much prefer to treat the easy things that we can fix instead of having to tell people, you know, you have kidney failure, you're going to be on dialysis, or, you know, you have heart failure, you're going to be going to the CHF clinic forever. And that, that kind of thing is tough. So truly, this is, initiatives like this, are what it takes because we have to go out there, we have to educate, we have to, to teach and we have to urge people to, to take part in their own health care, but also in that of others in their community. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer questions on the panel. Good morning. Well, I am not <clears throat> the expert once you get into the clinic. Uh, my wife is actually the expert who gets, um, who, who knows a lot more. She's a nurse works at uh, uh, Cardiovascular Associates where she's treating those simple heart attacks and other kind of things like that. But I, I come out of a background of um, impact analysis to foresee and to forestall. Um, I come out of a background where, where um, in the late 1960s, uh, Senator Henry Jackson from uh, Washington State uh, I got a piece of, of uh, uh, a statute passed called the National Environmental Policy Act. And that National Environmental Policy Act was uh, misunderstood for the last 30 years because people think it's about the environment. But it's really about that intersection and the many intersections uh, uh, that occur. So what I'm going to talk to you for a second about uh, is foreseeing and forestalling because the way we develop our cities and our communities are are, are going to are going to um, impact you and your community um, for better or for worse if you develop a city with no uh, grocery stores but small grocery stores where everything in there is uh, it, it's kind of like really awful for you and it doesn't have fresh produce, then, <clears throat> then you're not going to live healthy. And, and if you have a city that is developed without sidewalks, then there's no way that you're going to walk to that. So I'm on the front end of this. Uh, I, I don't talk about the clinic. I don't know anything about that. What I do know, though, is that people who make decisions about the way communities and towns are developed. And there's all sorts of authorities that they have. They have authorities for, uh, for zoning. You can zone things out and you can zone things in. And that's the responsibility of mayors and county commissioners. And, and when people ask me what I do for a living, I say I do policy, politics, and strategy. And that's, and for some reason, people have paid me for many, many years to actually do that. Um, and a part of what I do is try to help people understand how to develop in some kind of, and I will use the word rational kind of way, because that's really what I'm, what, what I try to be about is, is about rationality. And, and while rationality is a big abstract term, there are tools in which to you, which you can use. Now, so I'm going to tell you that health depends on people like people who have expertise in geography, who are geographers. They are planners. They are biologists. They are people who don't know anything about the inside of a clinic, but they are people who are doing things at the front end that have huge impacts at the back end. And so I will say that if you're in, if you're interested in this, in this health profession on, on the end that I'm talking about, then you're studying GIS, you're studying geographical information systems. 
if you're interested in environmental justice and disproportionate impacts, you will understand GIS systems because that's where you can find, you can use demographic data, you can use geological data, geographic data, all the different kind of data and integrate into one holistic look about the, about the things you're about to do that's going to cause the problems that you're going to see in the clinic down the road. And so how much we are in an automobile depends on if you keep widening the lanes, you keep adding lanes, and you take out the sidewalks in, the, in order to add lanes, there are impacts to that. If you, if you have an area that is, that is not safe to walk, people are not going to walk. So there, it's an integrated approach. And, and I will say um, another piece about, the, about looking at it from a, uh, uh, from a GIS perspective. If you want to really see the, the, this entire thing about community is a big, big deal and, and it needs to be addressed. And I'll give you, I'll give you the best example. Well, well, first of all, let me say the principle is environment, air, water, all of that stuff, it doesn't stay in one place. And so the people who, our best example that we have in Birmingham right now is that on the north side of Birmingham, which is predominantly African American, historically African American community, um, and it's where a lot of the industrial facilities were, were located, and we've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk about the air quality issue. Um, and it has impacted in a huge kind of way the community in those neighborhoods. But the one thing that, that, uh, that is being, uh, that the community, a larger community, say in Hoover, which is predominantly white, has begun to understand that air is not staying over there. <laughs> and so they got a problem too. So they're a part of a community, of a larger community which brings on a larger discussion. And you can do that with this environmental impact analysis that I'm talking about. And you bring, you, you integrate the communities, you integrate the disciplines, so that the, so that the doctor, oddly enough, is talking to a, to a geographer and, and understanding why those two disciplines uh, should be talking to one another. And so, so, so the whole planning exercise related to, related to health, um, you know, it, it does not start in the clinic. You've got to work your way back to what I think is environmental impact. Now, so I'll just finish with this idea. There is a project right now with the Pew um, Center the PEW Center, they have a health impact assessment project going on right now. They have, uh, they have resources for those, for those projects. Uh, there's a Dr. Aaron Wernham, who is a medical doctor, who discovered this whole idea of environmental impact analysis, which is the world that I grew up in. And uh, doctor, so Dr. Wernham has been, um, has been, and let me just give you a brief outline of what is, what is, what is an analytical tool that is say an environmental impact analysis look like so that then you can figure out how to click and drag this into the health area. Before a project is decided, before it is approved, you have some kind of proposed action, right? And so somebody's gonna propose something. Well, before you, before you, you go ahead and go from propose to decide, you do a look at alternative analysis. Are there alternative ways to go about doing this project? And then you look at the impacts of each one of those alternatives. And then you allow the public to come in and talk about this. And usually scientists, they like the quanti purely quantitative kind of, uh, kind of discussion. But this, this opens up a little bit of a qualitative uh, discussion too. And then you make a decision. But then you have to monitor to see that the impacts are really what you thought they were going to be. Because if you don't monitor, who knows? Um, and, and, the, and then at the end of it, you, you may have to adapt 
your project to the changing conditions that have happened. So this is my world that I operate in, and do, so Dr. Wernham has, is developing a health impact assessment that looks a lot like this sort of thing. So I can give you more information about the Pew Center and the work that they're doing, uh, but I'll just leave it at that for the, for the moment. Good morning. Good morning. The first two people said everything I was going to say. <laughs> And that's because I'm a physician, but I'm 50 50 medicine and politics. Because, as he said, I found out years ago that people who are making decisions about where your clinic is, where the rest stop is on the highway, are mostly politicians. And sometimes you have to just deal with what they hand to you. So we decided to be proactive and get involved with it on the front end so we wouldn't have as much to deal with on the back end. Uh, but when you look at disparities in people, Oh, exactly like Dr. Squire said, we're looking at preventable diseases and things that we could really cure. I tell some people sometimes if you go to a dialysis center, it's like a family reunion. You go in there, you see whole family members and groups of people. And the tragedy of that is that they have lost some of their output and dedication to the neighborhood. So what we've designed are our community health centers that are in the neighborhoods that are free clinics. Uh, in Montgomery with the Community Care Network, they are mobile clinics. And we use students to help run them. Medical students, nursing students, high school students. And this gives them another point of what she was saying is to see the health field and become a part of it. Because no one will take care of you better than you will. And so we have, what he was saying about I was proud of my students, we started recruiting kids in the fifth grade. Because in the fifth grade, you don't, you still pure, you still have certain ideas. You may even still love Barney or somebody like that. <laughs> you know? If we wait till you get in the ninth and tenth grade, that's gone. Your focus is shifted. And we used to have unlimited money for nursing school. At one time, I had about twelve million dollars I could give anybody to be an RN. Problem was the overall GPA when they got to college didn't qualify. They came from small schools, and when they got into a high school, they missed up the ninth grade year. So we decided to solve this by going to the fifth grade. We get them at the fifth grade. We do health fair at the fifth grade. We do health fair there, but we're doing one here today. So at the end of this, y'all come back, and we'll, we're going to do some screening for you today as well. But from the fifth grade to the ninth, if they do good, we'll give them a job. We have ninth graders making $8.75 an hour, 100 of them. And you expose them to things they didn't know about. It's not just doctors and nurses. I have a 19-year-old that's making $25 an hour as an ultrasound tech, something she didn't know existed. So once you get them in, give them hope, give them opportunity, and give them a chance, that will lead to more people coming into that pipeline that he was speaking of. It would also teach them how to go home and take care of their parents. You haven't seen anything until you see a ninth grade go home and take everybody in the house blood pressure <laughs> and tell them what's wrong with them and what's wrong with the meal that they're eating. Now you get a call back from the parents. <laughs> Unless you're going to buy these groceries, you need to stop telling my children this. <laughs> but if you got that impact at a ninth grader, think of what you got with a college senior. Think what you got with a sophomore in medical school just passed up too. Think about when you can take a van down into a dirt road and find that there's some families back there. And all this is possible now. Real proud of the Affordable Care Act. I did my part in it. I'm clapping for myself. <laughs> I caught the devil from it, from friends, family, colleagues. I had doctors cursing me out. We came here to be rich. You know, medicine's not like it was in the past. We got to get rich and get out. Yeah, some doc said, this is what we need. We want to see people who need to be seen. And that's what it's about. It's about this community coming together as a whole to solve the issues that he's seeing environmentally. I have patients now that are 32 with all type of cancers that live in the area where he's talking about, North Birmingham. They took their TV. Saw this commercial called 800-600-6014. They call the number. And they did them just like they did the people of Triana. They got $3,000 a piece if you got cervical cancer or lung cancer that can be attributed to the plant. 
What are they going to do with $3,000? The attorney got $6.8 million. <laughs> and as far as I looked at it, like the ones in Triana again, you know, they gave him $19 million. Seemed like a lot of money. Put $5 million in a clinic. Split the rest. The attorney in that one got $7 million. And the people got $2,000 a year for five years. $2,000 a year for five years. So it's up to us to come up with better outcomes, to come up with intervention programs. First thing you do when you walked in my center was, my CEO was sitting right there with the afro. <laughs> <laughs> when they told her to come to my clinic, she walked in and walked out. She called UAB back and said, I'm at the wrong place. This can't be a clinic. Because when she got in, she saw stair steppers, treadmills, free weights. I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> it's people in here exercising. Why shouldn't they be exercising? Isn't that what we preach? Watch what you eat and work out. So in my place, you're not going to look at, I don't know the name of them because I don't watch TV, but I guess Maury. You're not going to be reading a People magazine wanting to know what Janet Jackson did with Will Smith. You're going to be on a treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> if you got to wait that hour, that hour is going to be productive. So we can show you what to do. And it's open from 6 in the morning to midnight. In the neighborhood, people have a key. So while I'm up here, there's people there in Birmingham exercising now. <laughs> and there's just one mall that we can have. And guess how much it costs me out of my pocket? Zero. You get with your local elected officials. Again, politics on the first thing. City pays the light bill, water bill, power bill, all the utilities. The grocery store paid for the building. The feds bought the equipment. And the banks keep it up. <laughs> Zero cost. People told me when I open it, it'll probably work out right for about a year or two. We opened in 1985. In that neighborhood, the outcomes have improved. We have maybe about three diabetics at about 10,000 people now. And before in that neighborhood, everybody was a diabetic. <laughs> everybody had blood pressure problems. Because we would tell them, your blood pressure's a little high today. You probably need to see someone and do something about it. <laughs> and you probably could go join the Y if you got $1,000 initiation fee and $30 a month, but they wouldn't do that. And they're not gonna do that. So we have to come up with outcomes that they can do. He said something about, and I'm gonna call the name, Greensboro, Alabama. We did a three-day health fair down there. Went into the main grocery store downtown, we saw fresh pig feet. <laughs> fresh pig feet. Pig ears with hair still sticking off the ear. <laughs> you know. X-rated DVD tapes. <laughs> no fresh fruit, no vegetables. None. Everything in that store was harmful to you. They still had that what I call bulletproof lard. That white lard in that thick five-gallon can. And it was on sale. <laughs> right next to the fat back in the strickling. <laughs> And we'd have her complain because the people average cholesterol level was 375. We're saying, y'all in a rural area. You're supposed to be out. You're supposed to be healthy. And so you look in the store, you say, unless there's something on this X-ray DVD tape, they're going to tell them how to be healthy. There's nothing in the store for them. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to help create those environments. And I'm sure my 10 minutes is up. Come and see me doing the screen. Well, let me say good morning to everyone. And it, I am delighted to be here. I certainly uh, want to thank Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Rivers and Ms. Downing and to Dr. Eugenie, who I found out is, was born and raised just a few miles from where I was in Walterboro, South Carolina. And so it's a pleasure to be here this morning to share with you uh, about healthy lifestyles, a topic that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, while she's getting my slides together, uh, let me ask you a question. How many of you want to live a long, healthy life? Let me see your hands. Yeah, I think, you know, most of us will be willing to put both hands up. I think that, that we have an opportunity um, to 
make a difference. Dr. Slaughter said on last night that, you know, in the areas where we live that in terms of health statistics, you know, we're worse and that we're trying now to go from worst to first. So I think that we all have an opportunity to be a part of that and, and to impact that. So what I want to do is, they're getting my slides together, is I'm going to pass around this mirror. Because and, uh, I think it all starts with us. So when you look in the mirror, you know, you can look at your hair and say, oh, that looks good, or this is how I pants, or whatever words you want to say to yourself. But take a good look at yourself as you pass this around, OK? And uh, I think that we all need to, being that we're an uh, uh, educational institution, we all need to know the ABCs of health. So, you know, what are the ABCs of health? Uh, first of all, everybody should know what your A1C is. Now, you may say, well, you know what in the world that A1C is an average of what your blood sugar has been running over the last two to three months. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you know what it is, but we all need to know that because we need to know if we have diabetes or if we are pre diabetic. And then B, you need to know what your blood pressure is, you know? Um, and then C, you need to know your cholesterol. Uh, is, is it over 200? Is it 385 like the doctor just said? Or is it, or is it less than 200? So I want to start with this quote. And it just says, when, when health is absent, that wisdom cannot reveal itself, art cannot manifest, strength cannot fight, your wealth becomes useless, and your intelligence cannot be applied. Um, I, I think, first of all, we have to kind of get our mind right about food and what we eat, because a, a, a big part of our health depends on what we put in our mouth, if we move more, if we see the doctor. So I've been doing this for about 25 years now, and um, I've heard every story you can. So, so I want to mention a little bit about attitude. A lot of people will say to me, Ms. Jordan, you got to die from something. So you might as well just be happy, eat what you want to, and just, you know, enjoy your life. And then a lot of people think this way, you know, it's in my family, you know. I have a lot of women, I'm talking about weight management, you know, and they'll say, oh, honey, everybody in my family is big bone. My grandmama, you know, had these hips, and, and my, my mama, and, you know, uh, you know, everybody in my family is diabetic, okay. And so they feel like, well, that's just going to just gonna be a part of me as well. And now those of us who are in the faith community, we have to be careful because, you know, if God didn't tell us, then, then we're not sure we're going to listen to the doctor. So a lot of my physician friends will say to me, uh, Jeanette, help me out, because um, when I'm dealing with uh, a lot of people of faith, when I tell them you have high blood pressure or you have diabetes, they'll throw their hands up and say, I'm not claiming it. You know, or they'll go as far as to say, well, God didn't tell me that, right? And so one of my physician friends said, well, you know, he says, listen, well, if you're a Christian, that's awesome. But I think that the Christian thing to do would be to take care of your body because the scriptures actually tell you that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, so then, we, and then the other thing is they'll say, oh, well, God will take care of me. And I say to people, listen, don't expect God to do for you what you can do for yourself. I think, indeed, there is a part that we have to play in our health. So, you know, usually when you are um, on an airplane and you fly into a place, one of the things they'll say, if this cabin starts to lose pressure, put your mask on first and then try to help others, right? And so that's one of the things I want us to leave with today, that we make sure that our mask is on first, that we're getting that oxygen, we're breathing, we're healthy, so that we can continue to do the great work that we're doing in terms of helping people. And I do believe that those of us who are in here are doing a great work. But how, how many of you want to continue to do what you're doing, right? And then in order to do that, then we have to make sure that, that our health is intact. Um, so let me talk about some basic things. Latisha, if you can't get it, I've done this so much, honey. I'll, it'll come you know, back out. It'll, it's in my head. So, um, so that's some basic things that I want to tell you that we can do. And, and they're not difficult. I believe that small changes can make a big impact in our health. So the first thing that we need to look at is what are we drinking? Because one of the things that most time if you go to the doctor, they want to tell you two things. I don't care whether you have diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease or whatever. They're going to say what? Diet and exercise, right? Look at what you're eating. Look at what you're drinking. Manage your weight. All that impacts your health. So the first thing we need to look at it is what we're drinking. And, um, you know, we get a lot of sugar from what we drink. And so the average soft drink has about 250 calories in it, OK? Now, ladies, as a frame of reference, you probably don't need more than about 1,500 to 1,800 calories all day long. So keep that in mind, right? So let's say you drink three soft drinks. 
that's already 750 calories. That's not counting anything that you're going to eat. Guys, for you, you probably don't need more than about 2,000 to 2,300 calories all day long, so keep that in mind. Um, so we got to look at what we drink. So, so, so the sweet tea, which is the number one beverage in South Carolina, is the number one beverage in, in, in Alabama. Okay. So, and you got people who tell me, well, you know, when Jordan, I wake up in the morning, I give me a big old glass of sweet tea. He's a diabetic now, right? And I'm like, okay, sweetie, we got to get this sugar down. I, I was talking to a patient uh, about a week ago in Sumter, South Carolina, and uh, she said to me, I was telling, she was telling me, oh, well, you know, I drink. Um, <clears throat> she said, oh, I drink about three, four Pepsi's a day. And I, and I kind of leaned back. I said, well, I think we got to make some change. She said, well, let me tell you something. I'm a Christian, and this is what I'm doing. I'm waiting for God to say, poof, and all this diabetes shit is going to leave my body. And I kind of said, well, sweetie, I'm not sure it's going to work just like that. But let me tell you what we can do. You can switch from that regular Pepsi to diet Pepsi and get zero sugar. You can go to Crystal Light and cut out the sweet tea and save yourself a lot of calories, which is going to help your blood sugar. It's going to help you manage your weight as well. So we got to look at what we drink. So what should we drink? We need to be drinking more water. Everything you, I tell people, listen, what we need to do in terms of, um, of drinking is I tell people you need to eat your calories. Don't drink them. And if you're trying to manage weight or diabetes, that's one of the first things that you really should do. So what you drink matters. So this is kind of what we need to do. Now, the second thing we need to look at is how, how much sweets are we eating? How much candy, cookies, ice cream, pies, right? Because the average dessert that you see there is anywhere from 250 to 500 calories. So if we sit there with a big piece of cake or, or a big bowl of banana pudding, or a big piece of uh, cake with ice cream on top, you can bank that you're going to walk away with 500 calories. Now, how many calories are you should have a day, ladies? Did you? Yeah, yeah, no more than 1,800. So you see how you're putting a dent in those calories real quick, right? So, um, so, and I'm not saying never have anything sweet to eat, but I am saying, listen, let's turn to get a few bites, small portions, share desserts. And if you're diabetic, most days, leave it alone. Um, I think moderation is the key, portion sizes. And I got to tell you, I grew up in a little town called Walterburg, Dr. Eugenie, and my mom was a really good cook. And uh, so we didn't, I didn't know what a serving of rice was. I didn't know what a serving of mashed potatoes is. Does anybody know what a serving of, of mashed potatoes is? Well, it's about a half cup. But that kind of hurt my feelings when I saw that, because all we had was a big spoon. And you know, you just kind of kept putting it on the plate, right? And, uh, but, but, but if you're going to manage weight, if you're going to control diabetes, if you're going to control high blood pressure, heart disease, you've got to learn what a portion size is. So the, the serving sizes are important. So one of the things I'm going to ask you to do, you may already have these at home, but these are called measuring cups. They cost $1. I want you to invest in some so that we can begin to see, you know, what we're putting on our plate because our portion size matter. Now, this is a little saucer here, but you know, ladies, most of the time when we buy our plates, they have like a little circle line around them or little apples or flowers or something, right? So I'm going to help you out. Whenever you fix your plate, you're supposed to see that line. <laughs> you're supposed to see the roses, right? The little flowers that's all around there. So when you're sitting there, you can say, oh, that temperature is so pretty. But you know how it is? Most of us, the food is all over the whole plate. It's piled high. And the reality is, is that we're not that hungry. We don't need that much food. You know, in South Carolina, I don't they have it here in Alabama, but they have a lot of all-you-can-eat places, Chinese, all these different places, right? And people go in there and they, they sit there for hours, just going back and forth, back and forth. And they're like, and, and they say, well, you know, I, pay, I gotta eat my money's worth. I paid $7.95, so I'm gonna eat 3,000 calories. And all of those calories impact us. So we've gotta know what a serving size is. We gotta be able to cut back. And everybody just say, cut back. Yeah, we got to cut back on how much food we're eating. Now, what should we be eating? And I think the doctor mentioned this, and this is so very true. They did a, a current research, and it hasn't changed over the years. On less than 25% of people get enough fruits and vegetables every day. And I run into adults all the time who say, well, I don't even eat vegetables. I'm like, really? You know, but your vegetables is where you get your, your vitamins, your minerals, your fiber. So we've got to make sure that we're eating that half of our plate 
is vegetables and that we're, we're putting in our bodies what we need, right? Now, we also need milk. How many of you drink milk? Let me see your hand. Anybody drink milk? Yeah, just, just oh, maybe less than half, right? A, a fourth. Well, we still need the calcium. And one of the things they're saying that they think there's so much high blood pressure in African Americans is we don't get enough calcium. We don't get enough vitamin D. So we want to make sure that we're, we're doing that. I want, I know my time is, is, is coming to a close, but we've got to look at how much fat we're eating as well. So we got to decrease the intake of fried foods. You got to take the skin off the chicken. Somebody's oh, that's the best part of the chicken, right? Um, we got to take that off. But now, it's like what the doctor said, we got to get that pig out of our pot. Because <laughs> my mom, before she started any pot, would, you know, anybody know about the grease can? She's got a grease can on the stove. And I mean, there was a scoop of grease that went into everything, right? And then there was the fat back, the stricoline, the, those pigtails and ham hocks. And believe it or not, in 2011, people are still doing that. And we don't, we don't need to do that because that's what's hurting us in terms of heart disease and strokes. And so what we've got to do then, as I get ready to close, is, is look at how can we prepare our foods differently. Now, that brings us to another point because many people don't cook anymore. You know, we got these nice houses and fancy stoves and, and, and ovens and, and, and you know, you know, years ago when you go to people's house, you could smell the food before you got there. I mean, something was always on the stove. You could hit the yard and you knew somebody was cooking. And you go to people's house now and they got these nice houses and all you can smell is potpourri, air fresheners. I mean, no, no, nothing cooking. And we've got to turn that stove on and get away from so much fast food and feed our kids. One of the statistics that really is, is heartbreaking to me says that this is the first generation of children that will not outlive their parents. And that's because we're too busy. We're, we're running here and there, and they're in every sport, and we're in, the, in every club, and so nobody has time to cook. And I think we are doing our children an injustice because we need to sit down and prepare them a healthy meal. Now, we do need to move more. As the doctor said, we've got to exercise. We've got to make sure that we're moving this body. I have a, a young lady in our church, and she's overweight, has five kids, and she says she'll be upstairs, and if she wants something to drink, she texts the kids, bring me, <laughs> bring me some chips. Get me something to drink. You know how it is. We're sitting in the house after we get home with the remote control flicking all evening and tell the kids, go get the mail, go to the mailbox. You know, we, we don't want to move anymore, but we have got to be intentional about moving. And, and the last thing certainly is, is that we've got to begin to manage stress because we, we are so busy. We're running here and there. We, we, we're, we're not even enjoying life. We're not really laughing like we used to. You know, laughter in itself is like medicine. So, um, you know, there, there are two women who died and and they both went to heaven. And heaven is a friendly place, so they kind of started talking to one another, and the first one asked her, well, how did you die? She said, well, I froze to death. She said, you did what? She said, yeah, it was a long, cold death. I froze to death. She said, well, how did you die? She said, well, a few months ago, my doctor told me I had the metabolic syndrome. My sugar was high, my blood pressure was high, my cholesterol was high, and I was trying to make some changes, but I was at work one day, and my husband was home. And I don't know, something came to me and said, you, you need to go home, somebody in your house. And then, you know, my nerves got up. So I uh, told my boss, I got to go. I got in my car and I drove home as fast as I could and I bust the door open and there was my husband sitting there looking at the paper. And I said, where is she? He said, woman, what you talking about? You're crazy, ain't nobody in this house. So she said, well, I ran upstairs and I looked in the closets, looked under the bed. So I was just, oh, I was just all worked up. And then I ran back downstairs, opened the garage, fell dead and had a heart attack. She said, you did? She said, well, the late other lady got quiet. She said, you know, if you had looked in the freezer, <laughs> we both would be alive. So God bless you. Let's make some changes, and it all begins with us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a real hand now. Come on. Well, we'll be pleased to uh, entertain questions if the panelists would uh, so agree. Um, we have a microphone here if you'd like to walk up to the mic and pose your question and we have a mic on the table that we can move about so we can respond. All right? Questions? Good morning. My name is Stephanie Freeman. I'm a PhD student here and my question is to Mr. Clark. You were talking about the Pew Center and multidisciplinary approach in uh, looking at environmental health as well as community health. How successful has that been here in the state of Alabama? in your organization? Um, well, you say that I uh, 
first of all, as a caveat, I moved back from Washington, D.C. Um, after living up there for 25 years, and uh, and uh, I worked at the White House for six years, as uh, as was said. Uh, I, when I came back home, which is this is where I grew up, I was absolutely shocked at um, uh, at, at the obesity rate here. And I just heard just over the weekend uh, that, uh, that Alabama now uh, ranks either one or two. Uh, and at 50% of everybody is our obese. And so, so uh, <clears throat> the health impact assessment work, uh, put it in context, some of the first work that's been done by the Pew Center is in Alaska. And, and the reason it's being done in Alaska is because uh, there, the culture that grew up or it grew up up there with uh, with Native people, uh, they were they were subsistence uh, uh, farmers, um, hunters, gathered that, that was, uh, and, and they were very healthy. And then you have the oil development coming up to the Arctic Slope, and, and, uh, and over the last 20 years. Uh, obesity has shot up, uh, and, 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 and diabetes has shot up, and this is all from from uh, uh, more processed foods and, and more of that. So, so my point is that that uh, uh, that the health impact assessment at Pew is just getting off the ground, and I would love to see uh, some, some some pilot projects here in Alabama because. I think you could normalize between what's going on on the Alaska North Slope, oddly enough, and Alabama. Good morning. My question is about, I know that the average uh, Joe has problems with, uh, uh, with his health, and he's not doing things right. What do you think about the culture of doctors in terms of not really uh, prescribing exercise, and you know, you'd be sitting in a uh, doctor's office, you're sitting there waiting for 30, an hour, an hour and a half, and the pharmaceutical representative can go right on, you know, go right in. So what do you what do you say about the culture of doctors who always have a pill for everything? <laughs> Don't tell you to get on the treadmill or do other things. So pretty much just dealing with the medical profession. We are sometimes we are not right. I'm sorry, not, we're not right at doing what we're supposed to do either. It's how I do what I say, not what I do. Um, and I think part of this is, is the culture of medicine today. You know, fewer people are going into primary care. Our, our systems have broken. You know, they encourage you in, in medical school by not really what they say, but you look at how the subspecialists live versus how the primary care physicians live. There's a huge disparity there. And, you know, so we have a lot of specialists. We don't have enough people in primary care that are interested in teaching the basics. And then, just the way that people are paid in primary care, if you don't move 60 or 70 people through your office in a day, you don't make a decent living. You know, and so you're, you're, not, you're not compensated for that time that you spend counseling patients, teaching them. You know, it used to be that you sat down with your doctor and you told your doctor your problems and your doctor knew you and knew what you did. And that, sadly, has not lasted. And I, I think we need to get back to that and we, we need to do a better job of that. We need to, as health professionals, do a better job of getting people and teaching them. You know, yes, you need to exercise. Yes, you need to. I mean, there, there's some who do. You know, my, my husband recently, you know, you know don't take care of your family, you don't work. But he was diagnosed as being um, type 2 diabetic. And his interns, fortunately, sat down with him and said, look, you know, you either lose 25 pounds, you're going to be on this medicine forever, and you got diabetes, you know, you need to check your blood sugar. And he actually listened, you know, not to his doctor. And in that, that amount of time that that doctor spent investing and just telling him, look, you know, you're in charge of this. You know, you either take the pill and just keep doing what you're doing and get worse, or you invest some time and you invest He lost 20 pounds and he's getting on with that. And that, that is, if we would do more of that, and we're guilty of 
was charged. And in the ER, it's, we try to make an impact. We try to tell people, hey, you're smoking, got your medicines. I mean, my, my saying to people that, that smoke, especially if they are diabetic, you know, I try to never let a diabetic get out of my ER without saying, look at your feet. If you like your feet, quit smoking because diabetes and vascular disease that's worsened by smoking is just a deadly combination. All these people you see without legs, most of them are diabetics that smoke. And, you know, so every time you cut one, you just take a look at the toes, you know, look at the toe here, and you may not be able to get that in the future. So, yeah, we definitely need to do a better job. I think it needs to start in, you know, pre-med, that that's part of your obligation, and in medical school, definitely. And you're doing a great job of that, far better than we are. I'm trying. I think you just need to shop around. Uh, I think a lot of docs are doing that now. Um, but it becomes, like I said at first, when you, you tell people to go and exercise, you don't have a place for them to go. Or you can establish a relationship. So um, I have 583 friends who have just passed up to that response. And all of them will be like that. I mean, it's that they feel that they have to bear that. I mean, so they, I can tell my patients to be here basketball court. So if you get into it, and a lot of doctors are doing it. Several things, I mean, Congress right now, we're looking at the pharmaceutical industry, where we found out spends $3 billion a year on doctors and lunches. And so we were saying that, uh, so we, we did somebody to adopt. It doesn't impact on what I write. It doesn't impact, but like you said, they can get in and get seen by using that in way. And I think it's the office staff that gets them in and, and try to have an influence on you know, like that. So we're looking at the doctors who are doing it, but I think the office staff probably I just wanted to say, um, you know, well, I certainly agree with what they said, but um, and particularly in South Carolina, a lot of the uh, doctors are being brought out on the hospital systems or by primary care uh, physicians, and so you're right, they have to put out 50, 60, 70 patients a day, so time is a big factor. But Novo Nordis, who is the pharmaceutical company, is one of the people that I work with, they just hired about 150 certified diabetes educators to work with physician staff to go into the office to teach patients about diabetes free of charge, the patient as well as the, 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 um, the doctor. So I think that we understand that the education needs to be there because people can't control what they don't understand or what they don't know. So, and, and take advantage of registered dietitians, diabetes educators in your communities and, um, you know, Many of them will do free talks, some of them are at the hospitals, but the education is critical, and you're right, a pill, a pill by itself is not going to do the job. Uh, my question is for Dr. Ellison. Um, and you may have said this, is your clinic like the one of a kind in Alabama, or are there several clinics? I think there are several. Um, the one thing, like, uh, when we also have a small medical variable, so we respond to disasters. And we have a good relationship with TV and news anchors. So you know, right after Alabama got hit by the storm, we were giving free medicine, replacing medicine and stuff like that, and everybody who needed it in the storm. So one of the TV anchors who was on my PR committee got upset with us because I'm going to go on television and say it. I'm saying that we can't go on TV and say it. We're going to give you a few dollars in the medicine anywhere in Alabama. We're going to replace any medicine you would take. Likewise, we can't say, if you come to this place and exercise for free all day. Because we're trying to build our neighborhood so we can take care of the neighborhoods that we're in. And I want people to come in and go from machine to machine. I have 48 stations. Looks like I got 500 people sitting up there waiting that thing. So there's a lot of good places. I don't know about 12 of them. In Alabama? Yeah, Alabama. No. Is there one state that is kind of taking the lead on that kind of thing? Alabama, there's one state taking the lead.
Yeah, I have a dance group called Man Skills. Uh, medical and, and, and dance skills information. We run on PT four or five times. Um, on live Wednesday, we've been on MTV. So we got people knocking on our doors. Look, when a parent finds out you can get a child eight dollars and twenty five cents an hour, <laughs> we don't have any problem. But we have about 4,000 people, and I keep up with them on Facebook. I got kids who on Facebook that been on Facebook since they came. So they're in Ghana, they're in Korea, and we still communicate and with each other. Uh, South Korea, the lady that was here last night, for reading four hours, if you get on that list, sir, share the rich, because I'll be every grant for eight states and reading four. Natural Kings. Natural Kings. Yeah, Natural Kings. Um, and um, we get that the time for that list of grants that are pending. All those grants you put up on last night, they come out to pay Sam to the for all this. I really don't have anything to add to that because it's, it is it's, it's hard to get. A lot of it is, is um, just community relations and we're teaching people to learn and get. If people want to come to our hospital, we love to have students in our department and a lot of other places in the hospital. We love them there. And catching them early, you're right, to fifth grade, you see the middle schools, that's when they start to, to go down and, and they start not taking care of themselves. And if you don't catch them early, you can lose them. Okay. I will take money from anyone. <laughs> <laughs> the first twin meal I bought, I bought with money from a fifth set of mosquito control program. <laughs> and there's no federal agency that I think I'm going to ask for anymore. And I think that the, ins the insect control rules reduce the burden of mosquitoes who may be spread in malaria and Birmingham. They spent $600,000 on the kitchens. They had $400,000 on them. So I asked my sons, I need that $400,000. He said, for what? I said, well, diabetes and hypertension are killing way more people in Smithfield than the mosquitoes are. <laughs> <laughs> So I got one. So we can learn from the grant that we give grants to we from Ms. Watson and I sit on the workforce investment for. So we get a lot of money from the way up and we distribute. So there's no hook in your hair. I'll get money from the stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, are there other questions? Yes. First, I'd like to commend everybody for being here. I think everybody here, uh, main, main goal is to help our community. And uh, uh, my question is, is, uh, is, to, uh, is to enjoy it. And uh, the, the presentation that you had was, was very enlightening. I enjoy it, but I think that uh, my question would be how we how would we take that to the community? How would we you know I think that uh, I have family members I do a lot of people in the house projects in their areas. And I think that the and I have family members that need to hear that speech. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we take that to the And um, you know, one of the things I think I heard the doctor somebody said that, you know, you it begins with us. That's why I pass the mirror around. And you know, there's nothing wrong with, with us buying a blood pressure drug. You know, I, I've done it at family birthday parties. Everybody get their blood sugar tested. You know, um, you know so you, you have to begin with you and, and, and your family. But, but please know that you do have um, physicians, you have registered dietitians, you have health educators um, who really, as a part of what they need to do, need community work, where they need to come to communities and give talks and do health fairs and you know so I would connect with you know your health department and even your hospitals because a lot of times they have professionals and they will allow them to come to communities I do a lot of work at churches you know health fairs um, community centers you know and that's kind of, kind of how I got started in community work just going out speaking for free just taking information and then a lot of times there are health fairs and community events that are there, but so many times our people won't go 
So I mean, so sometimes we take it to them. When I first started at the medical university, Dr. S um, Slaughter will remember at Hollis Cancer Center, we had a band where we partnered with the Amy Church. And we went to every conference. And we went to communities. And we did blood pressure checks and diabetes and yeah. checks. And I would go in and talk to the conference. The bishop would give me you know, 10, 15 minutes to stand up and talk. And the people would come outside and get screaming. And they got scared because just about everybody had high blood pressure or diabetes. <laughs> Right, but I mean, and that's been a long-standing um, um, partnership between the Medical University and Amy Church. We're still right. on projects working with them. So, you know, I would say begin to talk to, you know, your hospitals, your ministries, wherever, the uh, family health centers, you know, people there can educate. So there's a lot of places that you can connect with health professionals that will go out. A lot of times, nursing students, medical students, they need to do internship work mm -hmm. and they'll go to, they'll come to you. They need to do it. And if you look on the front cover, you'll see a, a star on the road. This is you'll see a medical reserve course. Uh, a lot of our programs are the Surgeon General's office. Our primary responsibility is the but it's also the Surgeon General's priorities, diabetes and obesity is one of them. And they will come out and preach to the screen Free the information and that they get educated in that man and that was And then there's a great one up here in this area at home. And we'll they will come out through the screen and do their education plan with those things. I think you just kinda of answered it, but I the biggest the majority of our people are in church on Sunday or Wednesday or Vermont or whatever. Um, and the biggest impact Maybe, is through the preaching. It have have we thought about maybe having a conference just for the ministers, and you know maybe because if it's about community, one Sunday a month ought to be on health, what you eat, what you, and then see it reflected in the church meals and you know what what served, because that's you know that's where the biggest impact. And we you know as people we need to hear it over every month. Every third Sunday, we're going to have a, a health uh, sermon. So I, I, I just wanted to add that. I, I would like to say, I mean, you're right on target because at the Medical University, that's exactly what we, we, do. we are doing. Yeah. We um, partnered with the Amy Church, but now we've expanded to other faith communities. And we've done a project for the last five years that I work on where on some Saturdays we go into the churches and we train the cooks on how to prepare healthier meals, like just let's put some fruit on the table, at these teas, and you know, when the bishop come and you got all these cakes and pies and all this stuff. So we have taught them how to, to make salads out of whole wheat pasta. We've taught them, we brought in chefs that teach them how to prepare foods differently. So in South Carolina, the Medical University has led the way um, in, in, in working with the faith community. I'm also a pastor in, in our church. We don't drink coke, we don't drink sweet tea, we use crystal lighting with kids, right? Um, and we don't do fried food, we bake, we broil, and uh, and so, but you're right, that's where it needs to go. Every third Sunday, it's amazing you said third Sunday, is our health day. So we have a health moment uh, where uh, we have a health ministry and the Amy Church and the University uh, through Bishop John Hurst Adams. Um, actually, he made like this ordinance that the churches would have a health ministry. And so now all the churches in South Carolina have what they call health ministries. And so actually our health ministry uh, will do a presentation on health, we'll have signs of stroke, heart attack, whatever, and we also do screens. After church, they go in, they get the blood pressure check, they get the check for diabetes, they, we got a big old scale where they jump on, we see how much they weigh, and then we kind of make referrals for even people who don't have insurance to the family health centers, as well as to uh, wherever they need to go. So you're exactly right. The faith community is an excellent way. We've worked with pastors as part of this project. We've gone to the bishop's council. We've met with all the presiding elders, with the pastors, and we taught them first because they have to push it. If they don't push it, it's going to fall by the wayside. So, I mean, if you want to know more about it, we have to talk to you. But we actually, the medical university is doing that in South Carolina. And that's where your church is going to be in that state. Yes. What's happening out there? The power room, the lighting room, and you know, the exactly. Home, so exactly. We have clinics set up in the churches. Mm -hmm. The idea uh, and community care network, our mission is bringing faith and medicine together. And uh, Ms. Watts gets some cards out because we actually hold clinics in the churches that we don't have partnerships. Uh, we all quit in the church, and, and the church, the, the, the all the work 
computer service, a waiting room for the mobile unit for the churches that don't have room to park the mobile unit outside in the church parking lot, and we use the pews for registration. And the churches keep their own relevant. And like her, we established medical ministry, and that's been one of the biggest ways to address disparities uh, nationwide. Yes. So again, uh, we have a food away from the mobile unit. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to put in another plug for the, for the fact that, uh, that health action starts here, here, here. Oh, yes. It, you yes. know, it's in your environment. And so <clears throat> whether or not you can get to those kind of healthy foods uh, depends on the way your community has been planned. You know, and, and whether or not you have a grocery store or, or all of the kind of things that make a healthy community start with the built environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Cora Watts, would you please stand because you have really been a part of this dialogue and people, we all need to recognize you because I really think that what you're doing to help this mission is, is so important. Uh, I would, we're at the end of the session, but I will ask all of us to do one thing and make this promise to ourselves, and that is to take what we have learned here today and share it with someone else. Each one, reach one, each one, teach one. We do not want to just covet this information. Uh, young brother, I appreciate so much what you were saying about how do you get this and carry it forward. So let's figure out how we carry this forward, boy, because that's one of the keystones of these community leaders institutes, is to take the information that we learn and pass it on to others so that we aren't just keeping it within in, in these four walls. Uh, let's thank our panel again for an excellent presentation. Uh, as the uh, agenda reads, uh, Dr. Rivers, we take a break now. So we'll, we'll take a break and come back at uh, 1045, uh, 15 minutes, and we'll, we'll continue with the program. Thank you all very much.